So I'm happy to see you and I can uh, tell you that I will focus on very practical options. The theory behind the approaches will be given uh, by Maddie and we will both, well there's one slide of overlap. If you can point it out, I will buy you a beer or a wine or a water or a coffee. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Anything cold will do. Now, as Hendrik explained so well, we have common goals. And I think it is important to focus on these common goals and really move towards it. The way I see it, I want to really create like the best of the leadership in, in uh, energy courses. Because that would be really fun. It's good for the career. It's fun to do, so I think it's, it's really good. Also, based on the architecture, based on the partnerships that we have, we can actually realize this. But, there's one but, we need to move forward. Because other people are also, I can hear it if I go to a conference, people are asking, well, what do you do? How do you do it? What's your plan? So they are getting interested, especially for the business model. Now, we are, of course, working with recognized universities who are already leaders in their field, which is good. But now we need to make it more cost efficient. And Hendrik already pointed out to the nuggets or to the elements for the recipes that we all want to create. And I think there are some options here that prove that these, creating these nuggets will add to our work efficiency to the cost efficiency of the full program and also to our <coughs> but of course that's me talking because I really like online learning blended learning who are these does anybody know uh, just the general what's the main common factor with all these people engineers yes all engineers wonderful engineers Indeed. My personal favorite, Hedy Lamar, but also actress. Yeah. I see. I say also actress. Now, can you find the energy-related engineer? Difficult. Because when they became engineers, we weren't there yet. It's obvious we will create the, create the leaders, the next generation of wonderful engineers. But I would see Graham Bell as a potential energy engineer in his time. Now, I will show you four easy options and an enigma. Please try to come up with a solution with the enigma. Try and be focused. And it, does everybody have a paper and a pen or a pencil? Could you just, yes. You are well prepared, you have everything. <laughs> So the four options that I will look at are open educational resources that we can use. Open is slightly between brackets because uh, it might be that we have an uh, intellectual property that demands us to keep it slightly closed. Flip lectures that we can use and why we use them to optimize uh, the learning taking place in the courses. Activating the students with the practical side with some uh, real options and using authentic learning as a means to activate the students. Why do I keep returning to activating the students? Because from the feedback from the students and the teachers, there was a demand, a uh, frequent demand to make this happen, to increase the dialogue between both and to increase learning as such. Do you know what this is? An email. Yes, that's right. It's also I, I actually, yeah, that's, I know. 
I lived uh, five kilometers from uh, from uh, Bletchley Park, so I'm just I'm always happy to see that device. Now, using open educational resources will become more and more easy. The way I see it, we can use the courses that are being developed right now, that are already being de uh, were already developed, also. But there is like really a boom of content development going on within Inno Energy and within uh, EIT. So I think we should really make, uh, like Hendrik says, a kind of a repository, but I don't mean connected to the tool in this case, but really a list of all the options that are available, either uh, made by us or by some of our colleagues, and then start using it inside of each of our courses, if it's relevant. Now, in order to be able to use it, I think it's important to have some kind of granular uh, content hierarchy. Now, this is just something I keep on using to get my mind filled with this granular approach. Each one of us has like uh, learner interaction, no learner actions that they do. You create content, you add texts, you demand uh, some actions from the students, and all of these are like the elements, like from the recipe, the raw materials. <coughs> it's important to work with these <coughs> and to keep track of these, but that will be done by Learnify itself, just a small bit. Now, of course. We don't just deliver a video or you don't just deliver a text, you put it in a specific sequence so the learner actually has something uh, or has a surplus coming out of it. And this is where the nuggets come in, but it can be named any which way you like. But that's a meaningful part of a course. Now with these parts, we can set up new recipes. Like, it's like Bernays sauce, once you create it, you can use it in different recipes itself. There are some open educational resources, examples from inside of uh, Inno Energy and EIT. Are you familiar with them or shall I show them? You want me to just... Yeah. So, this is for Lady, this is it, this is it. So one of the courses that is, well, I will show you the, what do you think is the most interesting about this course, if you look at those uh, elements? Price. The price, I mean 11,000 euros. Of course it's an executive course, but it is a SPOC, it's a small private online course which is uh, created, and we can actually sell it. Now, if you take that, I look at it as a te from a teacher or a copyright owner point of view, 33% of that is a nice thing to get, I think. So, I would be into developing courses. How many students have <laughs> you are not This is not a master school course, this is an executive uh, certificate that they get, so it's something completely different. But, for our students, we can use some of the materials inside of that course, if it is, of course, uh, related to re renewable energy and specific content that you have in mind. Because if they make it for that course, we don't have to remake it. We only need to focus on things that aren't up to standards or that we are lacking. Another option, Yes. Another one is from your colleague Martin Vendel. And I will show you his introduction. It's a MOOC. And now I am asking you to find some, if there is a, some audio. Hi, I'm Martin Vendel, and I'm here. I want you to find a flaw in this movie. It's a two-minute movie, nothing big. I want you to indicate where 
it could be improved without telling Martin, I realize, we're always telling Martin, he can handle it. The director for the value creation through innovation specialization given by EIT Digital. I stand here in front of Haas School of Business and to welcome you to the first out of two courses regarding innovation entrepreneurship given by UC Berkeley. For those of you following the specialization, this is the second out of four courses. And we have now moved from the Royal Institute of Technology, Stockholm, Sweden, to UC Berkeley, San Francisco, in the United States. We have moved from one of the hottest startup scenes in the world, Stockholm, Sweden, to the San Francisco Bay Area and Silicon Valley, acting as the role model for startups, entrepreneurship and innovation globally. We have moved from the home of the Nobel Prize, Stockholm, to one of the universities with the most Nobel laureates in the world, University of California, Berkeley. For me personally, this is also a very special place. I'm from Sweden, but my father was born here in Berkeley more than 100 years ago. And my grandfather had his own medical practice in San Francisco at the beginning of the last century. And the story goes that he also offered his services to the Haas family. In this course, we will start with innovation and entrepreneurship basics followed by analyzing markets and how to engage with customers and finally cover open innovation. I really hope that you will learn a lot and that this course will meet your expectations. And for those of you that do not yet follow the specialization, please consider to join the specialization starting with the course, The Impact of Technology. Professor Andrew Isaacs is the program director for this course and he will, together with his colleagues, guide you through these exciting topics. What can, could Martin improve? More information about the course. Yes. Description of the course. Yes. Mm -hmm. And because it's an introductory video tool course, so definitely. What else? You can, he's not here, so you can just. <laughs> <laughs> I will cut it out of the movie. <laughs> the flow, will do like this. The flow of information. Because and what do you mean? The flow of information? That it was quite slow to get the info. Yeah. To uh, get more to like quick info. So entrepreneurship, blah, 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 so more okay. direct. More direct information, yes. Okay. Images, just talking and talking. Is there any visual description? Yeah. Nothing no. that you can read? Yes. Indeed, there's no meaningful visual uh, aligned with what he talks about. And for me, it was a repetition as well. Okay, in Stockholm and Berkeley. Yeah. 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 So the nice thing is, if we look at all of us, we, we, we are people who know what can be improved. We have this gut feeling. We're teachers. Most of you have taught a number of years. And so we can see these things happen. And we can help each other out, but also improve our own content. That's, that's why I'm recording myself. I know that I make mistakes, and specific mistakes I do over and over again. But in the end, after another 10 years, I hope to have improved. So I think that's important, that once we um, establish some more content, that we also establish some quality indicators for <coughs> each of our courses and maybe even have the guts, and I mean this in a very possible, a positive way, have the guts to ask someone who knows the material to have a look and give some feedback. Now, so the, now of course there are other MOOCs as well. Lots of them, and other online courses, because we shouldn't restrict ourselves to MOOCs or to uh, known online courses. But it's good to screen them. 
because sometimes they, like for instance, FutureLearn enables us to use some of the material in their courses. And if they have a course on energy, it's much easier and much more cost effective to go into the course, select the, the content and just download it, inform the teacher, ask them for permission, depending on the, the copyright of each course, and use that one. And it's also a good way to connect with others as well, because you can share information and the network itself grows. I also put in Shui Tang, which is the Chinese MOOC platform. Anyone speaking Chinese or Mandarin? Or, no, well, they are so. many, but not. <laughs> <laughs> they are many, but the language is. <laughs> but still, they are booming. They are actually booming. Now, I will ask teachers to curate some of this, these online courses for their own course purpose as well. So to look for information that is already made. Because um, if we use content that is already created, it will enable us to really focus on the gaps or to really focus on our field-specific areas. Now, as a teacher, I know Nobody has a lot of time, but there's a workaround for that. We can ask students to crowdsource MOOCs and online courses and, and for instance, ask them to come up with the two best online uh, courses or two best online nuggets that they can find online on the subject of, and then you insert your own uh, specific uh, topic. Why is this interesting? Because immediately you activate the learning. They are going to search for something and they are going to really take time to compare, to look at options, to go through options and to come up with the best possible uh, answer. This is deep learning that they, they will uh, deliver. And for us, if you have, for instance, you have content selected <coughs> four months in advance, and it's a third-party content, you have it nicely in your master school course, and all of a sudden the time is there where the course will be given, and it's taken offline. Then you need like a safety net, and this is it. I think it produces a lot of the material. Another thing that I um, like is browsing courses in order to talk to people you admire. That, does anybody do that? Like, connect on the basis of content? Yeah, I really like it. If I admire someone's work, I just look them up and it's the excuse to use it in my course. So just, hmm. And next time you meet them, they're, most of the time, they really like the fact that you are interested, even that you, you looked at the material that you wanted to use it, as so you have a connection going with one of the fields leaders, which is nice, but at least that's something. One advantage of the citation metaphor. Yes. Yes. It is. It's connecting and, and building a, or strengthening a personal learning network. Um, of course, even if we look at all the content, there's always going to be content that we don't consider as being really interesting or really high quality or there's simply a gap, because it's energy. So we're going to need to have different, uh, well, quickly updated content anyway. Isn't it slightly cool right here? So otherwise I will become a bit fight for them. <laughs> there's more, more meat on a butcher's pencil, is what we say in England. <laughs> yes. Um, so, in order to create open or at least educational resources that fit those gaps or uh, have the quality that we as teachers intend them to have, I listed some of the tools. The free one is Screencast-O-Matic, really easy. You just put it on, on uh, your computer and you start recording really easy. You can, of course, do what uh, Martin has done and record with a green screen. If you want a training on that, we can 
train it for like a living room setting because of course at KTH and I think at UBC there are some uh, production rooms but you can also easily do it yourself with a very limited budget if you would want to. But where Martin used uh, videos that he got from the universities, as Kim said, it's interesting to use visuals that really support the message that you are talking about or the content that you are talking about. And then I added a link uh, on Google Drive in community, but I will come back to the community later. Another option, so you have the open educational resources, but once you have those, there's uh, assignments and, and essays and all of the other stuff that comes to mind. One easy way to increase the student interaction, either with teachers or between them, between the students, <coughs> is the flip lecture, where Ingrid and Andreas will give us a lot of information about it, so I'm grateful already. I will only do a very limited uh, description of this. I think I talk to many of you, and what you clearly have is an incredible know-how. Each time there is a this, so I talk about education, but each time there's a content discussion, immediately you see at least two people going, oh, this is that, this is that. There's immediate knowledge uh, of the field in there. Now, I think we are currently underusing the knowledge that you have. I might be wrong. <coughs> I think we, have, we, are, we should increase the, or pull out the knowledge that we have uh, more strongly. And that can be done with, with a flipped lecture. The flipped, who is using a flipped lecture already in their courses? You don't really understand the meaning of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to know where we're at in the room. So a flip lecture is, so let's say we built a developed content. We have beautiful content describing specific aspects of, uh, of, a distill of an energy uh, problem. Now, Understanding the content that you've developed demands deeper understanding from the students. And in the, in the flipped lecture, what you do is you provide them the links to the content and you ask them to go through them. Keep in the back of your mind uh, why is this better than another type of uh, energy solution or what is novel if you compare it to then a previous uh, historically engineering uh, solution. So you give them like two, three questions to really think about, difficult or slightly difficult questions, while they go through the online material. What you're doing at that point is uh, stating a baseline. So you make sure that those who still need to understand a lot are really pulling themselves to a level where they can understand the material that is offered. And the ones who already know it, they just go through it and they don't lose a lot of time, they can focus on things they don't know that well. Of course, a learner can be wrong about what they know or don't know, but at least they had an opportunity to be part of a baseline for the course. Then you ask the, stu the students to come into the lecture and you clearly state in advance, we are going to work on specific problems, or we are going to uh, really discuss this or that uh, challenge or problem or case could also be the case. Now, normally if you have a regular lecture, you're going to um, provide content for a long period of time. Now, this means that you as an expert who really knows how things are uh, linked together, do not use your real expertise with the, with the students because you're just, it's one directional. So you never know, are they really uh, attentive? <coughs> do they really understand or are they just, if I do this, I can just keep on dreaming? I mean, you're not sure. You want to make sure that they do learn. And that's where the flipped lecture comes in because the moment they come to class, it's active. They don't just have to listen. They either do group work, they do a discussion, 
and everybody is involved. That's the main uh, idea behind the flipped uh, lecture. And because of the discussion, if you hear, uh, let me give an example. If you say, look, I'm going to uh, point to, to two students and they will have a discussion on a question I'm asking related to the topics that you saw, and I want arguments. Then you hear the discussion, everybody else hears the discussion as well, and you as a teacher can say, oh, this argument is a good argument, this argument slightly flawed because, and you go back. And as they are discussing, you know who gets it and who doesn't. So it's a very important way to know that if they really are ready for the next stage. That's why I also think it's, you don't need to make, you definitely don't want to make every uh, element of the course into a flipped lecture type of approach. But for the very complex ones, the ones who year after year you hear the students, oh, it's too difficult, I didn't understand, what, this problem, that's where they they come in handy. Is that clear? No. You'll see, you'll see more examples. More, more or less, when yes. our days are uh, teaching select with yes. the video conference with the other student KTH, some fluency. Yeah. Conflict is can be quite uh, difficult, it's not us. You mean fluency in terms of the connection? Exactly. The technical connection yeah. between... Yeah. So yeah, to do something that can be fast, quickly, and make the dependence of the students yeah. at the same time. Because people are, are watching you by, by me. Yeah. So it's not as fast as I think that is required. It's yeah. very interesting, of course. Right? Yeah, if yeah, it's but not as easy as yeah. doing uh, teaching in person. Yeah, but the flipped classroom philosophy is that you do your homework, listen to the presentation, yeah. and when you are in class, you do active work yeah. based on that. So uh, I'm actually not that happy about using the video mm -hmm. conferencing link for lecturing. That's uh, for me, it's a step backwards because it doesn't add anything. But it adds complexity, mm -hmm. not quality. But using a flipped classroom in this setting, it could be really beneficial. So the students are up to a, a certain level, and then they can discuss, and then put have discussions here in, in Barcelona and in Stockholm, and then they connect and have a discussion. Then you doesn't need to use the video conference link all the time but they can connect and have discussion between the two sides. So I, 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 then I see the benefit of having the different uh, Would it, would it be necessary, necessary to see each other? Yeah. I'm going to flip the classroom. I don't know. The students in Barcelona, yeah. I see the students, and we spoke to all my students. But, but you can question the students, yeah. so they prepare on each side, and yes. then they have a discussion. Mm -hmm. and you so uh, there is a lot of room for inventions. Yes. <laughs> and you can also work with, I don't know how, of course, how it goes, but you could work with a, you <coughs> two sides, with one teaching assistant, which could be a student as well, on the other side. And then have, for instance, uh, active group work for a moment, so you don't use the link at, at that point. And then, yeah, and then use the results of the group work while using the conference. Tool. Then you have a flipped classroom, but still the connection. But then the information through the the meeting or conference uh, tool is limited. It's not, but but I will. Add something, another option as well, because it's uh, it's that, good to hear. Well, no, no, my thought is, as a yes. first step is okay, because yes. you are preparing it. But then, if you want to have a debate between people from PTH and people from UTC at the same time, it's quite more difficult that you have at the same time. That's my question. Yeah, but first step can... is okay, but then you want to include some this additional discussion. In my opinion, from my experience, it's yep. quite more difficult. But I'm. Uh, I'm preparing some questions to, to the people and I saw that okay there is only one person in KT which is managing it, it's collecting the, the questions that it not became uh, as interesting debate as expected. That's, yeah. so I think that's you, you I'm not that. saying that it's not good. It's just 
There is some difficult some additional difficulty. Yeah, yeah. It's, so yeah. they just chose one spokesman, yeah. a spokesperson for taking it, and then is that what happened? Yeah, in our oh. cases, use, uh, usually the, the guy from KTH who is managing, I don't know, Peter, Peter, mm. Oh, well, yeah. 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 I would definitely, I mean, no, he's going to get somebody no. to help him. Yeah, but yeah. I would also it say is. that no, doesn't mean. But when you can actually give them slightly different questions, uh, uh, same question but from different angles, mm -hmm. and then they start on their own, and then they connect, yeah. and all of a sudden they open up a bigger view on those sides. Yes, it's like working, if, if you do group work, you also work in your group, which is uh, local at first, and then with the results you come together to, in the, in the, let's say, in, in regular session or in a conference session. With the results from each group, you can exchange uh, ideas or comments. And then you have the activation of the students already, and you have the results adding to an additional layer of uh, discussion to the flipped classroom. But indeed, it's not uh, ideal if you want to discuss uh, all the time from one end to the other end. Mm -hmm. Then I would definitely say group work mm -hmm. while the camera is running because yeah. you want to just see that. I mean, no, you, group four, the one in the black shirt, why aren't you saying anything? I mean, that's how you activate the result, just uh, so. Another so, aspect of the classroom, I talked to a secondary school teacher, and he was using his uh, iPhone and yeah. we were making the calculation on paper. And the lecture that take, normally takes 45 minutes, he covers in 50 minutes on the A4 paper. Mm -hmm. So he saved time, the students saved time, instead of listening together with, with others with a lot of disturbance in 45 minutes, they had it in 50 minutes and they can repeat it how many times they want and really work on the homework in the classroom solving problems and then he can help out the students one by one so uh, if there is Another idea is something that me and Inga have as well, because we've heard about the learning theatre, that it is quite uh, basic. <laughs> it's, it's like it's, there's no interaction at all. So we want to improve it. And we've come up, well, there's, there's all sorts of virtual classrooms out there that, okay, you've got the cameras, you can still have the students there, but then you use an online tool which has their faces, so their actual faces are being filmed in front of them on their computer, and they, you could have two people in UPC, two people in KTH, and they could work into a group together online. So everything that is captured is saved online. So that's another idea of actually activating the students so that they get to know them much better face-to-face -face as well. But that's another tool that we have to yeah, yeah, let, let look into. <laughs> You are not forced to. No, to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah, it you is. should use it when it adds something. Yeah. yeah. So uh, even though we have the tool there, the equipment, you are not forced to use it. No, no. But so, uh, if you think you can do it in a better way when you're working across these boundaries, then please come up with a suggestion because you don't have to use the learning theatre. You know. Just an idea. Mm. There's, uh, we're going to come up with lots of ideas. <laughs> Which is That's not the I can see your, I can see your problem. But oh, my, sorry. my simple question is that yes. when I take a picture, say, what do you think about that? Yes. About the structure, about comparison between renewable energy and conventional energy and so on. Okay. From the students that have here, it's clear. Hands up and then we yeah. start with the debate. The people who see it in KP, I don't know if it's talking about or not. So how are we managing? And then I want to hand up. And it's better to say, okay, uh, here we have one question, you know. Because you said that's my the, yeah. problem. How yeah, can we do it more? Yeah. I don't say that it's, it's not good. It's no, no, no. But How you could do it online, couldn't you? You could yeah, have, you yeah, know, I as see. in Adobe Connect, you put your hand up, and you know, people are talking, you know, the whole time. So there's other tools is, that we all have. I'm, at trying our to do. I'm just yeah. saying that it's yeah. quite more difficult. Yeah. yeah. Now this is one of the big problems that the students' feedback came back with on the. On the, uh, yeah, the problem is that service. you need to take attention to the, the students you have in your classroom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you have 20 students in the other classroom yeah. that you cannot see. Yeah. Yeah. That's, 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 that's why. Right. Right.
Yes, um, that's why I really would like to see a teaching assistant, which can yes. be any type of person with, uh, I mean, not any type of person, but an active person, either PhD student or a master's student or another teacher that wants to help. Because you need to have like this closeness. Yeah. yeah, and you need to make sure that you have feedback, what works, what doesn't work. Like with the picture, that they say, look, it's not clear, and that you say, ah, it's also available online here for, or something similar. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing is, if you focus on complex material, then this sometimes uh, really works well. So, so you're only recommending that for complex, for difficult content? Uh, because then you have, uh, you provide like a personal learning path to the learners. That's, that's yeah. So from a pedagogical perspective, the ones, it's like I said in the beginning, the baseline you want to establish will be complex. The ones who learn quickly will have it immediately. The ones who learn slower will probably watch the video a couple of times, read the text a couple of times. So that's why I see this as a good thing for complex material. And then, in com of course, in combination with the teacher being present to see whether they understood. And yeah, because before you go to the next level, you want to make sure that everybody understands it or know why they don't understand. But this is why we're here. If you wanted to flip your classroom, if you wanted to do some filming, we have the possibility to help you to, to make a short film and so that you can upload it in the, in the repository. That's why we're here. Or so, you can be there in the classroom and, yeah. and see how it works and then understand why it doesn't work, for instance. Mm -hmm. no, it's, in our case, we have a very nice experience. We yeah. have some uh, practice yeah, in sure. our yeah. laboratory. Yeah. We have made a video. We yeah. go over the video. It's only five minutes. Yeah. And we teach ten minutes explaining that. The video is very, very interesting for the students. Yeah. They see the installations. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's good. Yeah. And yeah, it's a very brief video. <laughs> Not a large video. No, exactly. <laughs> it's really short. Very a half an hour short. film, you know, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> so, about activating the students, in slightly adding to the flip lecture kind of uh, part. So I'm going to give three options, uh, going from really basic to slightly uh, technologically uh, supported to deep reflecting, let's say. So this is the first one. Small whiteboards, as you have the papers and the pencils or the stylos or the... It's small whiteboards are great. For instance, this is a, in a classroom setting, young students in this case, but they needed to work in groups draw up a, a specific uh, solution and then show the solution uh, through the small whiteboards. That is easy, it doesn't cost anything. So, which option do you prefer at this current <laughs> stage? And please put it on your paper and show me. <laughs> you can choose. Using a <laughs> <laughs> activating students or only those the white? Or yeah, the just the whiteboards. So whiteboard. you have a question and you say, put it on your whiteboard and show it to me. So, what's. Of course, I, I'm not an engineer, so I can only come up with educational elements. But what do you like? And be aware, I might ask a second question once your whiteboard goes up. And I will wait until everybody puts up a sign or paper. So you take a paper, you put it on the paper, your answer, and you show it to me. They are complementing things, no? They are not substitutes, they are complementing yeah. things. So. Yeah, yeah. You can use a uh, proper There's line. only one solution. <laughs> <laughs> In a flipped classroom. Yes. Depending on what they're explaining, okay. you can use. Definitely. But that shows me your thinking. Okay. <laughs> no, which is good. That's, that's why 
that's why it works. Because you think, yeah, yeah, but I can just not do one thing and not the other. Or what do I like? I mean, this in this situation, this in the other situation. It would be much more different, the dynamic, if I would say, if I would only have said, open educational resources, resources are this. Uh, flip lecture is this. Then it would be boring. But now you activate and you reflect and you start to internalize some elements. It's not clearly, of course. But I do hope someone goes with the crocodile. Mm. <laughs> so cute. Yeah, it is, isn't it? <laughs> Big mouth and small ears. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's, that's true. Don't listen to anyone. Just <laughs> tell your own story. <laughs> Jordi. What? What is on the? Uh, I don't remember. That is an open educational resource, so something you find on the net, but you haven't necessarily made yourself. You could have made it yourself. Mm -hmm. But it is like it can be a video or an audio or a text <coughs> or any type of content uh, material. This method seems complementary, no? Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. Okay, that's my activity. And what did you have? Yeah, activity. Well. And I will come back. You yeah. know I will come back first. Well, you right that, uh, the three methods are completely better. Yes. One better than other. You can play with all the three methods, you know? Yes. But the Kukurala, I don't know. Really. <laughs> <laughs> yes. so if you can't decide, you can choose for the crocodile. Until the right knows the attention. Yes. Go for the yes. unknown. Yeah. I have a, a small tale for my little daughter that says drawing drawing a cow a cow. But then it says, yeah, there are two ways of drawing a cow a cow. But then it starts drawing a crocodile and it's super good because it cuts the attention oh, yeah. everybody, you know, because it says one thing but then it draws That's another, another thing. I should <laughs> 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 OER and activating students. Yes. Trigger events during the... Students flip lectures and OER in a combination. And what did you have? OER and flip lectures to activate the students. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, yeah. That's like uh, pedagogical architecture. <laughs> and you? Well, actually, for me, this is kind of higher order thing. And then you activate students how? By different means. Yeah, that's right. Depending yeah, on yes. the day or on the topic. That's what I thought. One except for the crocodile, which I guess. Yes. <laughs> it's not to fit in the crocodile. Yeah. <laughs> it's a visual, visual person. So pedagogical, because higher order thinking, you think in, in, in uh, real learning terms? And but I'm using the crocodile, which is the project that one. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <snapper. laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, uh, the project flipped classroom, which okay. is activating students. Yeah. Uh, but also there is a deadline, so you have yes. to submit <laughs> something. So students have also the pressure. <laughs> I really like the <laughs> <laughs> Oh, also visual. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like you can draw. Yeah, because synthesis I like the, of yeah, yeah. The flip lecture and, um, during the face-to-face -face sessions to do project in groups and using this whiteboard. This I think it's a good idea. So good. Oh, nice. I like it. Yeah. So thank you for. Oh. Wait a minute. There's always one in class. Is <laughs> you know how it is. It's <laughs> Go for the crocodile. <laughs> <coughs> Combination. Perfect. I think it's I think it's good. So 
Do you think it, something like that works? Maybe not on Monday at this time, but it's... No. <laughs> yes, it's yeah. on Monday morning. You don't want to shock people. In, yeah, that's true. Another option uh, which uh, you can use for other occasions is Mentimeter or Poll Everywhere, because I don't want to well, push forward one option or not. Now, the nice thing is, it can be, Mentimeter has multiple options. It, it's a, so what is Mentimeter? It's a tool which is online and it gives you options to use your phone and to jot in some ideas or uh, fill in a multiple choice question or open question. You, you can write, uh, I am using Kahoot, but you can only answer, answer multiple choice. Uh, in this you can write something? Or? Yes, yes. 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 It's, yeah, and it's uh, for free for well, and it's not that expensive if you go for a pro account. But Maddie will. Uh, I'll show you a bit about. Show you, it. Yeah. Okay. Actually, the company is started by KTH students mm -hmm. because they were supported about the teaching at KTH mm -hmm. while there were not that much interaction. So then they built it. Wow. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Yeah. <laughs> you made it! Yay! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You, you missed an incredible situation. Uh -huh. If you were only here five minutes before. Can you replay? <laughs> it's recorded. Thank you. So again, it's about ensuring that everybody is involved in the class and also to provide some type of visible learning to the learner themselves. Where are they? Where is the group at? Because the nice thing of Mentimeter is that you uh, that it gathers the solutions given by the students. So and you can use it online, which means everybody with an internet connection can take part in it. Now, having said that, I'm going to just quickly prepare some. Well, no, I will not do it. But, yes, I have another idea. So I will come back at Mentimeter in a little while, but first go for uh, peer reviews to uh, activate the students. So a peer review is typically used in a lengthy assignment where you ask the students to prepare uh, yeah, to do an assignment, obviously, either on a case or on a project or on uh, something which is tangible. And then they are asked to upload their assignments to a central repository. In most cases, it will be the LMS. And once those uh, are uploaded, the students can be put into groups and asked to review uh, works of others. Now, that in, uh, as an activation is okay but it becomes much more interesting if you add a rubric to it because and you give the rubric before any uh, assignments are filled in. So the idea is if you deliver a rubric, you have some grading criteria. So a rubric is used to grade an assignment. That's what teachers use uh, most of the time. Uh, it's either something put on paper or in their head. But you have certain grading criteria to know whether an assignment is really poor quality or really really top quality or something in between, most of the times in between. Now, if you provide the students with a rubric, you're going to <coughs> give them ways to reflect on the quality of their assignment before they actually take action. So they look at the criteria and they want to be the best, so they're normally. So they would look, what do I need to put in the assignment to get really good quality? They make the assignment, of course by then they, or as people do, they forget some of the grading criteria, they go back to the rubric, and again they compare their assignment to the rubric. So you see there is already an iteration of learning going on, going back and forth using criteria that you know are important for, the, for that assignment or for that little piece of uh, content. Once they upload it and they start having to compare others or to review others, uh, other people's work, 
there is an additional layer, uh, more a skilled uh, skills type of layer that comes into place. Because if they are going to look at other man's work, at uh, work, the work of others, touch here, insert touch here, then they will have an increased skill of having to evaluate something. Because in their working life, they are going to be having to make decisions. They have to make decisions based on evidence, what we call evidence, on quality, on criteria. So in a way, we not only ask them to become better at their assignment related to the content, but also you increase their skills to be able to evaluate something. So that's why I put peer reviews also as activating students. Of course, there is one downside. If you can't upload assignments into an LMS, then, yeah. What is an LMS? Ah, it's a learning management system, like uh, Atelier okay, or the yeah. Builder or Canvas. Yeah. Now, Luis, thank you for the moments I have had with this 360 degrees camera already. So apart from activating the students, this is something really practical. It's not higher order learning, but it can support higher order learning, or at least it can support learning throughout. There are 360 uh, degrees cameras out there, which deliver, uh, so what is a 360 degrees camera? That's a camera who takes one picture or one video and it immediately shows the ceiling, the floor, all sides of the room or all sides of an engineering plant or all sides of architecture, whichever type of uh, environment you're in. And you can zoom into it. So let me show you what it does. Now this is very boring material. I just took it in a workshop that I gave with a, for a couple of people. So what you see here is the camera or you can go to the ceiling. Interesting. The air conditioning didn't work and it was a heat wave that day in Belgium. I was like totally sweaty. And people, you can see here that people are scared of me. They don't dare to sit on the front seats. Afterwards they did. They, they saw that I was not going to be a crocodile. <laughs> you can also zoom in. What is this woman doing on her cell phone during my presentation? Can you dig it? Horrible. Horrible woman you. No, she's a nice woman. So, and now I was, so normally it would take a lot of time. It's something which was first done uh, with five cameras set up. So kind of difficult. But I will show you how quickly it can work now. So if you ever go on a field visit, you appoint a student, and you have the, the permission of the plant owner. You appoint a student, or you do it yourself, and you take the 360 degrees camera. It's no bigger than this. It takes pictures and movies. No, if you want to, I can show you a movie later. So. And I will do this in real time now, without going into a contest of time. Now, you see here, the downside of the camera is that you see it kind of a weird hand if you hold it in your hand. But it goes quickly. It's the only thing it needs is you hear blip and the, photo, the picture is taken. Now, if you don't want to have the hand, but of course, <laughs> it's good outside, you can use a stick, like a selfie stick, something similar. But if you do that, you can't, of course, if you stick the, the camera on top, you can't reach the button. So that's why it has Wi-Fi in it. And with any cell phone, and I can assure you, this is any cell phone, it's a very cheap one. I will just 
put on this Wi-Fi as well. And once you told your smartphone that it needs to connect uh, to the camera, it will always take that one as a priority Wi-Fi, unless you, of course, change. Now, this is like an image taken. I'll show you the pic I'll show you the picture soon. Then it transforms, uh, it transmits the picture right to the cell phone. And I will pass my cell phone around. And that's about it. So it's really I'll pass it around. That's all the time it takes if you use a pole. So if you don't use a pole, it's zip, zip, zip. You go through a plant, you, ha you see something really specific, and you, can, and you can just look at the picture and zoom in or out, whatever you like. So I, I'll, I'll give you myself a And you can save it down in a specific format? Yes, or? you can save it, or you can also load it up to Facebook or Twitter. Um, so they can load it up to the learning management system as well, yes. yeah? Yes, can, you can learn, uh, load it up to the management system as well. So you can really use it inside your courses. Uh, of course, it makes most sense in a real... Uh, infrastructural environment. But so it's this easy and the setup <coughs> including this but without the, 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 the phone but just the camera and the stick is less than 400 euros so I, my suggestion is that each colocation center will get one of these for uh, if you go on field trips you can just use it uh, right there because if you are standing in a refinery, you can of course take pictures of specific elements, but with an overview picture you get much more of a sense of uh, being inside of the plant's end, which I forgot to bring, was the virtual goggles. So it's just, you can even work with a cardboard box from Google, you just put in the camera, you put it on your head, and you can just over and like this and look at all the, the elements and zoom in through the virtual headset. Do you need to talk as well? Uh, you does it record? It does record sound as well. Yeah. So it's... I'll have a... So Louis can go around his plant with his goggles yes. on and, and give a lecture with you, the, the, the camera going yeah, just and, and uh, download almost. it and upload it onto the learning management system. Yeah. So for them you support. can just go around if you... If you push one button, it turns into a video camera, you just start recording, and but you must, before you use it for real course purposes, make sure to have tested. Because sometimes you look just, or it might be me, but sometimes I look really weird. So it's good to know the best angle. Like, best angle? <laughs> it's one of the lenses towards you. <laughs> and also, if you haven't washed uh, your hair for, the, uh, for, let's say, enough to make it look greasy and you take a picture like this, it's going to show. So it's the, all of those things. Uh, I mean, sorry if I share too much, but still, I mean, it's important <laughs> to uh, think about it. And I will load this or part of this up. Then you have the, well, why didn't I say something less? Uh, I will show you the so I think that is really a nice and easy tool to integrate in, the, in your courses. So this is what I did. Now I want you to do something else. It, does everybody have a cell phone with a Wi-Fi? Yeah. Or an other, or other data connected? So I'm going to show you the Mentimeter. I'm going to highlight. I will return to this slide. I'm just going to. So. 
Now, so this is to show you that it's. Huh, ah. So you go to menti.com, you tick in this code. There is a workaround, not having to tick in the code, but I will tell you later. And then you can add anything you would like in, uh, to add your select codes. So what Mentimeter does is really put it together, which is rather nice. And you can also see how many people have responded. So you know if you have a class of 20 students, you would want 20 students to pop up here and just really know that they are engaged. Of course, this is less uh, personal. It's not like with the whiteboards or with the papers. It's more anonymous. And that also has a, has a surplus that it is a little bit personal. So you can, if you ask a sensitive question, for instance, did you, under, well, I don't know, did you understand this aspect or that aspect? And sometimes students are hesitant to share that they don't understand something. You still get the feedback, but they don't have to show that they didn't understand. So it depends on the student group or the yeah. Activate the students is really it's a, so this is yeah. So this is really easy. You can also you can also ask yes. So you see it's kind of easy to use, and, uh, but if you want to embed it automatically in your PowerPoint, you need to use a plugin as well. So I put in the plugin. Ah, and you, uh, you can also ask students, if you have some students who are more accustomed to using Twitter, you can ask them to use it through Twitter as well, which actually works. And then I come to the enigma. I hope, I mean, it was, I don't know, but yesterday was a very important day. It was the anniversary of one of my role models, one of my inspirational people. He comes from Barcelona. So, where is this picture taken? With the goggles, which I so I was taking a 360 degrees picture while watching a 360 degrees video. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Back where? Almost. Okay. Well, in the, in the same family of options. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Also in the same... Uh, <laughs> 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 Close to Parkway, there is this 
360 Gaudi experience? The, in the exhibition center. It is, yes. That's the exhibition center of Gaudi. So they have these, these setups. And in the video, you see the crypt, Gaudi script, which otherwise would take you three hours to go to. And, and you see people walking around, setting up the crypt and the crypt inside it, and such. And also with audio. And they also have other options there, which are really nice to just have a look at. <coughs> so you saved the enigma. Should have made it more difficult. So Gaudi actually uh, had his birthday on the 25th of June. But 165 years ago, so a little bit long, but still I was happy to be And I am slightly over time. So coming back to the common goals, I think we can actually reach it with some simple uh, additions to the courses and each one adding to the course what they like, because I think it's about being motivated to do to add the things you like. So I think we we actually are, of course, the leader, but we want to stay the leader in energy courses as well. And we can use both the granularity and the structure that Henrik uh, proposed to ensure that we have this cost-effective way of combining content that is already there and working with the know-how that each of us has to really take uh, the student to more deeper learning experience and then of course authentic learning and activating the learners. From our side, what Hendrik told it and Maddie will also uh, add to this topic, we will assure the optimization between the repository and the LMS, which is ongoing. We will compare smooth location to location conferencing tools as many said, and specifically for, to tackle those problems if we can, uh, with the options that they want. And we are also looking for ideas, but I already, I'm so happy that you shared your ideas and comments already, because it gives a good indication of where to go next. And then to follow the granular content hierarchy. But it's a, to, well, this is obviously me. Ah, why I put in this? It's always the same slide, that's why everything is on it. But the presentation, I will share it also on SlideShare. I haven't done it yet because I was busy with the presentation until one minute before leaving. I'm a de terrible deadline worker. I need multiple crocodiles <laughs> to make sure I'm on time. So, that's it. But if you have questions or additions, but you already gave it. Mm. Coffee is served over there, so maybe we can take the discussions yeah. and the uh, coffee and easy sandwich. Mm. Mm. Ooh, so you drink, yes, mm. Mm. so you can yes. pep up your sugar notes. <laughs> <laughs> thank, so thank you, Inga. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Do you yeah. want to stop the recording? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Take off the break.